Kamala Harris's closing argument, live from Washington. Donald Trump, live from perhaps the most important state of them all. Welcome to the final week of the 2024 race. Live look just down the road from us here in Washington, Vice President Harris set to give her closing argument as Donald Trump today made potentially his last stop in Pennsylvania. This is an election that's uh, really a choice between whether or not we'll have four more years of total failure. This has been the worst four years I've ever seen. All this comes as there are renewed questions tonight about what China might have on our presidential candidates. The New York Times is now reporting that China targeted the phones of Donald Trump, Eric Trump, Jared Kushner, and Harris campaign officials. Now, it is not known, at least publicly, what, if anything, China was able to access or learn. Good evening. Welcome to Washington. Thanks for being with us tonight here on The Hill. I'm Blake Berman. The big questions, though, tonight are are this, or at least can be summed up this way. Can Trump or Harris move the final persuadable voters in their direction? And which campaign is able to win the turnout battle? Keep in mind, as of this moment, at least 51 million Americans all across this country have already cast their ballots. We begin tonight out on the campaign trail. Our Robert Sherman is once again in Pennsylvania this evening. But we begin with our Kelly Meyer just down the road from us at the famed Ellipse, where Vice President Harris gives her final argument. Kelly? Yeah, hey there, Blake. Not too far away from you guys there in the D.C. studio. We got to stay on the campaign trail here in Washington tonight. The campaign telling me that this is meant to be symbolic, similar to what we saw in Texas as she used the Lone Star State as the stage for her message on abortion rights. She's using this stage here in front of the White House to paint a picture, the campaign says, of what another four years of a Donald Trump presidency would look like. So she's really going to make that case to voters, especially as you mentioned, those persuadable voters. The campaign telling me moments ago that they feel that this uh, position is working, that what they are doing, this message they are sending tonight about former President Donald Trump is working with those voters that are on the fence about who to vote for. When I asked about those folks, like in my hometown in Wilkes Ferry, PA, at the counter, and they don't really feel excited about either candidate, is this message tonight going to speak to them? And he said, yes, there is a part of this message that will speak to voters who are are looking to get inspired to get out there to vote, as is, is what they're saying. But there are some that are critical of her message at the end of this campaign with one week out, not being in a battleground state, being here in Washington, D.C., and focusing on the former president instead of focusing on herself and her own policy. Blake? Yep, interesting choice indeed. By the way, the Harris campaign joins us live here on the Hill in about 25 minutes' time. Kelly, thank you. Meantime, as for Donald Trump, He's in Pennsylvania this evening, perhaps the most important swing state, 16 electoral votes from Pennsylvania. He is holding a rally in Allentown, where he is expected to speak later this evening. Our Robert Sherman is once again following the former president. So, Robert, a week left to go. Trump in PA tonight. What are we expecting to hear from him? Hey there, Blake. And the former president is on the ground here in Pennsylvania. And there's a lot of enthusiasm for here in Allentown. I'll show you the scene that's behind us here. There are thousands of people who have come out to try and get into this event and hear him speak. Some of these people have been lined up since 6, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning in order to try and secure a spot. He just had those comments in Drexel Hill, that roundtable in which he focused heavily on Medicare, on Social Security, on the economy. But he also went big on immigration. Take a listen. Inflation and the economy is the number one thing. And third is the border. I don't think it's that. I think inflation's horrible. It's destroying people. It's a a country buster. But I don't think it's inflation. I think it's I don't think it's the economy. I think the number one thing is the border that millions of people are being (laughs) sent into our country. 
All indications are that Pennsylvania is going to be razor thin. The Decision Desk HQ average of polls has it neck and neck between Vice President Kamala Harris and the former president here. I would say this as well, Blake, about Allentown. This is actually a majority Latino community here in Pennsylvania. And the former president still distancing himself from that joke that was made by a comedian at his rally in New York City over the weekend. He even made mention of it here on the ground in Pennsylvania, saying that he supports Puerto Rican citizens and believes that he's done more for Puerto Ricans than any other president. But it is something that has become a conversation here, as you have seen a few demonstrations taking place on the ground in the Commonwealth. Blake. Robert Sherman, live for us tonight in Pennsylvania. Robert, thank you. So one of the key issues in this election is the cost of housing. And another reminder today of how out of reach home ownership remains for many. Home prices in America's 20 largest cities increased by roughly 4% in August. That is compared to the same time frame last year. Tomorrow, we learn how much the economy grew in the third quarter. Thursday, there's a reading on inflation. You just heard Trump talk about that. Friday comes the jobs report. All of this right before Election Day, as the economy, as we've seen time and time and time again, poll after poll, the economy remains issue number one. Joining me now is Kevin O'Leary. He is the chairman of O'Leary Investments, Shark Tank fame, friend of the show. Kevin, thanks for being with us here on the Hill. Final week to go. Here we are. Great to be here. Thank you. You got it. Um, I, I want to start here. Paul Tudor Jones, you know who he is, but for our audience here on News Nation or listening to us uh, on Sirius XM, billionaire hedge fund, hedge fund manager known within economic circles. He, he was giving an interview uh, in about the past week or so, and this is what he said about both candidates, Donald Trump, Kamala Harris, and I want, you to, want to get your reaction on the other side. Between Trump and Harris, you probably got the two people least suited for the job that's ahead of them. Kevin, I like talking to you because you don't, you don't care about red, you don't care about, green, about blue, you care about green. Is Paul Tudor Jones right there that neither Trump or Harris are suited for the moment? Well, that's an interesting comment, but it's not very uh, useful because the country has to make a choice. And I, I really don't show for politicians. I show for policy. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. trying to make a point here as I get into the narrative on the election. you got to look, look at the policies because one of these two people is going to make decisions about policy. And I think the president of the United States only has one job. It's to protect the American dream. There's a reason this is the number one economy on earth. It has been for 200 years. It's the American dream. This is where capital wants to come. More than 50% of invested capital on earth comes to the United States of America. We don't want to mess that up. So policy really matters. And so to make a statement saying neither of them are fit for the job, well, one of them is going to get the job, and you better be looking at the policies of each to decide which vote you're going to cast. And I simply say, look, we haven't spent enough time on policy at all in this election. And that's why I'm just one voice saying, hey, you want to talk about housing? Let's look at Harris's policy. Can she really build 3 million homes? No, I don't think so, because that's not the federal mandate. It's state by state that decides the land, unless she's right. willing to give up federal land. If she can do that, that may help, but it's still a state mandate. Number two, 28% tax rate? No, that's not the American dream. That would be the highest tax hike in history of corporate rates in one swoop of the pen. That's a bad idea. And look, I'm not against her or for her. I'll have to work for her if she's the president, no question. But mm -hmm. that is a bad idea. And I think so, we should talk about that. And we haven't been doing very much of that. The so what about, what about border, this policy? That's a huge issue. Yeah, what, what about, let, let's stick on the economy for a second. What about this from Donald Trump? Because he floated uh, the idea of no income taxes and replacing that with tariffs the other day. Here he was on Joe Rogan. Did you just float out the idea of getting rid of income taxes and replacing it with tariffs? Well, okay. Were you serious about that? Our, yeah, sure, but why not? J.D. Vance seemed to do a little bit of cleanup, Kevin, for him, calling that uh, quote-unquote no, aspirational. What's, that, Trump do, what's Trump doing here? No, no. I mean, there's, there's an idea in other countries where you get rid of corporate taxes and you increase personal taxes because corporations are fungible. They can move anywhere. And when we raised our taxes in America to 28%, they went to Ireland. So that'll happen again if we do this. It takes a couple of years to happen, but it will. Trump's use of tariffs is for negotiations. That's basically what he's doing. So let's, let's talk about 
reciprocal, there's an act floating around on the Hill right now about being reciprocal on tariffs. So if Germany charges 10% for car tariffs, we charge 10%. Right. And for most of our trading partners, it's tit for tat. That's what NAFTA was all about. But China's different. We're in an economic war with China. They came into the WTO in 1999, and they have not played fair since then. They cheat, they steal, they don't protect IP law, we can't own real estate. It's, it's a huge problem. We can't litigate in their courts, and they litigate in our courts. So we need to find a way to bring the supreme leader to the table. The only thing he understands is staying in power. Everybody understands that about him, and that's very clear. So the way you stay in power there is to make sure everybody has a job. You want to crush job creation in China? Pick a sector and put 400% tariffs on it. Not forever, just for long enough for those people to get nervous about keeping those jobs. So I'm just using a hypothetical example, but let's say we make a million right. yoga mats a week in China. Okay, throw a 400% tariff on yoga mats. No one's going to bring them in from China. The guys who make the yoga mats and the factories where they're stamped, they'll go out of business unless they solve this problem. You know, Supreme Leader will be on a plane in 48 hours smiling at Trump in Washington or Harris, whoever the president is, if they do that kind of tariff negotiation. That's you know, what one of the things about. on t- one, one of the things on tariffs, Kevin, I was at the White House covering the quote unquote trade war during the Trump administration. One of the questions I keep asking, Donald Trump put the 300 billion or so on China. Joe Biden kept every single penny of that and added on top of it. And, and I wonder what if Kamala Harris wins the election, what she would do on tariffs. Would she roll some of those back? Would she take the Biden stance of keeping them? Would she take the Biden stance of keeping them and going further? I, I don't know what she would do. Well, I wish she would interview her about that because she hasn't given us any policies. <laughs> she's very light on policy, very light on policy. You know, she's, been, she's done many interviews. I mean, I don't want to be critical of her. I'd, I'd rather answer it this way. There's a reason she didn't win in 2019. There's a reason she got nowhere in 2020. And somehow we've assumed that all of those problems were fixed in 36 months while she was vice president. And the Democratic Party, and they're going to have to do some soul searching about this if she loses, decided to circumvent democracy and made them, they they picked her. They simply anointed her. I bet there's some soul searching going on right now as we get this close to the election and it's so close maybe the same problems that held her back in 2020, like Verbal Salad City, coined by, you know, one of their own advocates, that's a problem then, it's a problem now, the inability to seem authentic, the inability to answer a question when put straight to you or a follow-up question, that hurt her in 2020 and apparently is still hurting her now. Maybe you don't circumvent democracy next time because it has the tendency to turn around and bite you in the hiney. And that could be happening as we speak. Let me leave you with this. We got the Capitol behind us. No matter who wins the White House, there's a real shot that one party wins wins the White House, another party controls one of the two chambers in Congress. How do you see it if that happens? Because as you know, the tax code is up for a rewrite next year. What happens then? I love gridlock in Washington. My favorite thing. Absolute traffic jam. Nothing gets done. Perfect. That would be great. That's what markets like, certainty of nothing. That's a wonderful thing. But that's not, that may not be the case. That's why this election is going to be one of the most important ever. I've never, ever seen an election this tight. And I get the data. I see these polls. I know what it's like. Right. This is absolutely yeah, extraordinary. Them. I don't think that's going to be the outcome. We'll see. But I'll be awake all night because this is about money. And it's about policy that affects investment decisions all around the world. This is a nail biter. This is, it's yeah. sheer circus right now. I've never seen anything like it, but wow, is it entertaining. Indeed. Uh, I'll be up all night too, because I'll be doing the morning show here on News Nation all week. <laughs> uh, so I'll be with you. Kevin O'Leary, talk to you again soon. We'll see what happens here the last seven days. Kevin, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. You got it. All right. Still to come here on the Hill. Only seven days to go as both Harris and Trump are in a fight to the bitter end. We break down where each candidate stands going into the final week. Plus, he is one of the most wealthiest men men on the planet. He owns the Washington Post. What's Jeff Bezos? Did you hear what Jeff Bezos had to say about why they aren't endorsing a candidate and what the owner of the Post said about his own publication? Plus, Brian Enton, back on the road talking to voters. Brian Enton, where on this country 
How are you tonight? I got a couple hints for you. Uh, the state we are now, they have the most mountain ranges. They have the most hot springs. You can vote none of the above on state and federal ballots. Uh, and this one, I think, will give it away. More hotel rooms than anywhere else in the world, Blake. Huh. Hotel rooms, a lot of them. I'll, I'll do process of elimination of Florida because you talked about mountains. Brian and I are both from there. Enton, other side of the break. Where is Enton <laughs> and his reporting? You're staying with us here on the Hill. Back and forth. All right, welcome back here to The Hill. We focus on Nevada consistently as it is one of the seven key swing states that will decide the next president of the United States. And just a week before the election, the Biden administration now giving the green light to that state for its first lithium mine. After a series of legal challenges, the U.S. Department of Energy finalizing the $2 billion loan for Lithium America's mine in Nevada. Now, it will help reduce the dependence on lithium supplies from China. It also comes as Nevadans head to the polls. Our series across the country tonight, driving the vote, continues. Brian Enton, live in the state of Nevada. He is in Las Vegas. Hello, Brian. Hey, Blake. Yeah, we finally made it to Nevada. We are on the Las Vegas Strip. Look at this. There's nothing like the Strip here. They're actually getting ready for F1. You can already see them constructing the track out here, F1 at the hmm. end of the month. Uh, but it's fascinating to be here, obviously, because this is one of the big swing states. So it really comes into play. Uh, and 25% of voters here are Latino. And that's what we've been focusing on while we've been in Nevada. Uh, it's interesting talking to the different Latinos. They do not like when you try to put them into a political box. Take a look. Uh, okay. <laughs> A steamy summer night in Las Vegas and a lesson in bachata. Rhythm and chemistry layered with a Latin beat make for success on the dance floor. It's a spark successful candidates need to strike with the nearly one in four voters in Nevada who are Hispanic. Hi, welcome. This is my latest listing. And if there's one type of Latino voter that candidates need to reach... It's Alina Gardner. This way is the kitchen. The realtor moved from Cuba as a young girl, able to show her beautiful listings in English. This is the master bedroom. As you can tell, it's very large. And in Spanish. Aquí vamos a la primera habitación. Bien amplia. She's also what's called a persuadable, meaning even though she's a registered Republican, her vote is not set in stone. I get a lot of uh, uh, texts and emails from the Democrats, so I, I listen to both. So I'm, I'm open. I'm open to both. So these are my girls. This is Izzy. She is 14. This is Alessandra. Ivette Aldaba will have her daughter's top of mind as she votes this November. The college professor is among the estimated 36 million Latinos eligible to vote this time around nationwide. That's up from 14 million in the year 2000, an increase of 153%. Having immigrant parents um, and them not being able to vote at the time, um, I felt that civic responsibility even more. The question, not just in Nevada, but across the country, will Hispanics still vote for Democrats at a rate of 66 percent as in decades past? For Aldaba, it's a definite yes. For me, what stands out is their reproductive rights. I want my, my daughters to have a voice to be able to decide what they can do with their own bodies. Well, I'm going to tell you, when I, st I started showing support for uh, Trump in 2016, actually a couple of years before that, I lose a lot of friends. Retired blackjack dealer David Mendez turned to the Republican Party based primarily on the culture wars playing out in his casino. For a man that feels he's a woman and he's dressed as a woman, he can go into the woman's bathroom. And to me, that is just a big no. I got two sisters and I got a mom. And I don't want to see a creepy guy following them into the bathroom. When I started in the early 2000s, you heard the, the big phrase, the sleeping giant. The Latino vote is the sleeping giant, which the giant has been awoken. 
Rudy Zamora of the nonpartisan voter engagement group Chicanos por la Casa serves a community that mirrors the country as a whole. There's young voter apathy and distrust in election integrity. I've heard conversations from my aunts and uncles saying, oh, back in my country, my vote doesn't really matter or the election was already bought. That's not the case here. Every single vote is it's a one vote, one voice. Six, seven, right away. One. Here we go. Up. Just like in bachata class, the countdown is on for the persuadables to decide their moves come election day. I'm willing to vote for a Republican. I still don't believe he should be president at his age. And uh, so as of right now, it's going to be Kamala Harris. All right, so busy out here uh, in Vegas today. Pretty day out here. You can see we're passing by the Paris. We got the Bellagio on the other side. Uh, and it's going to be interesting next week or so with the election coming up. Fifteen uh, percent more Latinos expected to vote this year, this presidential election in Nevada than any other uh, election. Blake. Wow. Brian Anton live on the strip. Brian, have fun. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Still much more ahead here on the Hill. Other side of the break. Live look just down the road from us in Washington. The closing argument for Vice President Harris and one of her top advisors joins us on the other side of the break. All right, welcome back here to the Hill on News Nation. Just seven days away from the historic presidential election tonight, the Harris and Trump campaigns making their final pitch to voters. Left side of your screen, tens of thousands of people awaiting Kamala Harris, the vice president, who will deliver what her campaign is calling closing arguments from the ellipse in Washington, D.C., about 30 minutes from now. We will take that live when it happens. On the right, live look, Allentown, Pennsylvania, where former President Trump will speak at the top of the hour as well, just some of the scenes. So one week from tonight, the first polls, some of them at least, are closed at this point in time. And later in the evening, we hope to have a sense of who will be the 47th president of the United States. Tonight here in Washington, you see some of the scene there. Just outside the White House along the famed National Mall, Vice President Harris will give her closing argument. The vice president, we are told, will say at one point, quote, America, we know what Donald Trump has in mind. More chaos, more division, and policies that help those at the very top and hurt everyone else. I offer, she says, a different path, and I ask for your vote. Joining us now, Ian Sams, who is a senior advisor to the Harris campaign. And as you can see and hear there joins us live from the event. Ian, thanks for being with us here on the Hill. Appreciate the time, sir. Beautiful night in Washington for you there in the backdrop. So I was looking at some of the excerpts, and it it struck me, Ian, that in them, the vice president says as much about Trump as she does about herself. Is that the game plan for her tonight? Well, I don't think that that's entirely true, and I apologize for speaking a little softly with music of America the Beautiful playing, but I think what you're going to hear from uh, the vice president tonight is going to be really a choice uh, between which direction this country wants to go, which direction the American people want to take it. Do they want to go back to the chaos and division of Donald Trump? Do they want to go back to a president who, on this very site, showed us all in the most infamous moment of himself putting himself above the country? Or do we want to pursue something different? Do we want to turn the page? on all that and chart a new way forward with her own vision and her own plans to bring down costs, to protect reproductive freedom, and to take on the issues that people actually really care about. And that's what she's going to say. She's going to say, I'm going to show up every day to the Oval Office with a to-do list on behalf of the American people. And Donald Trump is going to show up to the Oval Office every day with an enemy's list of his perceived slights. So that's that's some of the messaging that we'll, that we'll hear from her tonight, Ian, and it has clearly been a theme of the vice president's in the last week or so. It struck me, though, seeing this quote today um, in Politico, and this comes from a Democrat in Detroit who's a school board member who's voting for Vice President Harris. Quote, it doesn't play well in communities that are struggling to make end meet, ends meet, and that's the problem. They are talking to the wrong people. That is a quote about the warnings that the vice president is making. And I look, Ian, 78% say prices are higher than their income over the last, 70, uh, over the last few years. 79% say we are on the wrong track. Is that really the only card that the campaign has to play at this point when the country says on issue number one, it's not working for me? 
Well, absolutely not. I think she's going to talk about her plans to bring down costs tonight. And I think for any voter out there, anybody who's watching your show tonight who's worried about costs, they have to think about the fact that Donald Trump is proposing a plan that would raise costs on middle class families by an average of four thousand dollars, four thousand bucks, because he's going to put in why place is not, why is it not cutting a 20 percent sales why does, tax on imported goods. Why is it not cutting through, though, when you have Democratic supporters in Detroit saying, listen, this is the wrong message down the stretch? Well, just yesterday, we were actually in Michigan, and she made three different stops focused on the economy in Michigan. She visited a manufacturing site that's creating 1,300 new jobs thanks to the CHIPS Act that she helped get done that Donald Trump is actually threatening to roll back. And so I think when it comes to the economy and the election, there really is a clear choice, and she's going to talk about that tonight as part of this closing message. She understands that there are people out there who are still hurting, who still want to see lower costs. She agrees that costs on things are still a little bit too high, and we have to do something about it. And I think that what she's going to propose is to say, look, do we want to go to a guy who's promising tax cuts for those at the very top where independent economists are saying that he would blow up inflation? Conservatives are saying that he would blow up inflation. Or do we want to actually do something to take down prices, to take on corporate price gouging that's screwing people out of high, high prices at the grocery store, especially when you see like a natural disaster like we saw with Hurricane Helene and people were price gouging? You know, she's going to say, do we yeah. want to have cap prescription drug costs at $2,000 a year? These are the concrete ideas that she's running on, and she's going to be talking about them tonight. Ian, there was a hot mic, hot mic moment in Michigan last night. You, you know it, but for our audience, I'll play it. I'll get your reaction on the other side. Yeah. Oh, we have microphones. Oh, look at everything. Oh, I didn't realize that. She said uh, that, that you have a problem with men. The polls have showed that out. The vice president clearly saying that to Gretchen Whitmer. There are 51 million Americans at least who have already voted. Isn't that an unsolvable problem for her at this point in time? No, and that doesn't really reflect what we're seeing in the numbers or on the ground. I think she's building a pretty broad coalition of voters who are supporting her in this race. Obviously, we talk about the gender gap. We also have to talk about how Donald Trump is doing so poorly with women in this country because of what he did with Roe v. Wade. And so actually, the vice president is seeing significant momentum among men uh, who, are, who are coming to the decision that, that going back to the era of Donald Trump is just something they don't want us to take. And they're choosing her ideas on bringing down costs and protecting their health care. You know, this is a real bread and butter election, and she's talking about issues that actually matter to people, including men out there who are trying to, you know, bring down their costs, people who want to start a business and be leaders in their community. She's got real plans to help them do that. Let me leave you with this, Ian. Um, I'm going to be speaking with Scott Tran, our data science director, DDHQ, right after you. Here's some of the numbers in Nevada, which is the most blue of all the seven key swing states. And in Nevada right now, the early voting electorate is looking like R plus five right now. That is a change of R plus nine. That's what the data is telling us. If that's what the data is telling us, why should Democrats feel confident in Nevada? Well, we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, Republicans voting early this time that didn't vote early four years ago. Four years ago, Donald Trump was running around trashing early voting and saying, don't do it. It's corrupt. It was a lie. But that's what he was saying. This time, he's actually encouraging his voters to go vote early. And so what we're actually seeing in the data is that these are a lot of Donald Trump's own 2020 Election Day voters who are just casting their ballot early. We feel really good about okay. the numbers that we're seeing in our own early vote push. We're exceeding our own internal metrics from 2022, and we're excited uh, about bringing this home next week. Ian Sands, Senior Advisor to the Harris Campaign, thanks for being with us here on The Hill. Hope to talk to you again before Election Day, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so across, you got it. Across the country, more than 50 million people, really 51 million, have now voted er early, either in person or by mail. Scott Traner, I just name-checked you, Data Science Director, DDHQ. Um, so I email Scott first thing in the morning. It was like 7.30 <laughs> Monday morning. And I'm like, Scott, it's the last week of the election. Tell me the story. What's the story? Part of it, at least. We're going to go through some of the data here as it relates to um, the early vote electorate, registration edge, and the expected electorate. Before we do all this, tell me what this is. 
So what this is, is we have a voter file, so we know who these voters are in Nevada. Okay. Nevada, the Secretary of State, so this is official, they, they tell us who voted and who's requested ballots. And sometimes um, in states like Nevada, we know what their registration is, we know their gender, we know their ethnicity, and we know their party registration. Hmm. So we assume that if a Republican returns a ballot, they're going to vote Republican. If a Democrat returns no. a, a ballot, they vote Democrat. Independence, we kind of split 50-50. Right, right. Okay. What do the numbers tell you in Nevada? So I just asked Ian about this. Yeah, yeah. What you're showing, current margin, early vote electorate, R plus 5%. So of the ballots that are returned, more Republican ballots have been returned than Democrats. Hmm. Voter registration edge. So that tells us, hey, out of all the available voters in the state, are there more Democrats and Republicans? And what that shows is Democrats have a 1% advantage. Okay. The reason why you see the 2020 on the right is that shows you the shift from 2020. So the Democratic Advantage registration in 2020 was D plus 6. Right. So, so it's, it's moving more Republican. Okay. Um, expected or electorate. So this is the biggest moving number. This mm. could change. This will change tonight. This okay. will change the next day. It'll all change right, the right. next five days. Let's do it. But as of today, it's R plus 2.7. Huh. So what we're saying is all the votes have already cast. There is 2.7% more Republican ballots returned. And you see movement there on the Republican side. Let's go stay in the Southwest, go to Arizona. The story there, Trainer, is what? story in, in Arizona, which it switches over, even more Republican okay. um, electorate, plus R plus 8.5. And again, Ian's not wrong. What we're seeing in Arizona is a lot of voters who showed up on Election Day hmm. um, are now, you know, voting by mail or right. voting in person early. So that is true. We are seeing a small amount figure about 5 to 6 percent of the total electorate. People have never voted before. And on the Democratic side, we're seeing a little bit less, about 3 to 4 percent. OK, so that's that's good news for Republicans out west. Yes. Is the headline. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pennsylvania, most important state. We talk about you've talked about it a billion times or a trillion times. Numbers, guys, somewhere in between there, right? All right, yeah. let's see what's going on in Pennsylvania. Whoa, look at that! Ex- uh, expected electorate. Guess what? Even. Even. Yeah. Which ties their forecast, which has it at even. It as did. Well. I mean, that's why we yeah. keep talking about this thing. Yeah. The biggest number, though, early vote electorate, D plus twenty nine. So obviously, the Democrats are returning ballots and, and voting early in person, but that is less than it was in twenty twenty, at least at this point. It's mm. R plus twelve. So the Republicans are showing that they're going to come out early. Now we're going to see where this moves over the next week because right. Pennsylvania still has more ballots coming in. All right. So I asked you, what's the good sign for Democrats here? And you, you told me it was in North Carolina. What is it? Yeah, so when we flip over to North Carolina here, you're going to see a slight advantage in the expected electorate, right? Okay. Republicans ahead. Well, look, voter registration advantage tells us that, hey, D- uh, North Carolina is a D plus 1.4. So we think the ballots coming in over the next week could actually maybe make that even, hmm. just like we have in Pennsylvania, which is a state if she wins means we're probably going to be talking about this race for right. a week. That'd be big news out there. Yeah. Uh, just some of the numbers that Scott Trainer goes through on a daily basis at this point. Scott Trainer, DDHQ, thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right, still to come here, Jeff Bezos under fire for pulling the Washington Post endorsement of Kamala Harris. But how much of this was actually really just a business decision? Full panel, other side of the break. Stay with us. A live News Nation special. It's time to have your final say on this year's race for the White House. Join Cuomo, O'Reilly, Smith, plus Cuban, Palin, and Kennedy. Tomorrow, only on News Nation. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. Live look at two very different scenes right now. Just down the road from us in Washington, the Vice President Kamala Harris set to give her closing address, as her and the campaign put it. Right side of your screen there, you can see Allentown, Pennsylvania. Donald Trump set to rally before Harris takes to the stage. Marco Rubio on stage there uh, when Trump speaks. If he does in this hour, you will hear it live. Harris expected to speak in about 45 minutes or so. All right, full panel now. Samantha Dravis, former Trump administration official. Joe Khalil. News Nation Washington correspondent Julia Manchester is the national political reporter for The Hill, and Brad Howard is a Democratic strategist. Hello, all. Look at what we got here. <laughs> hello, hello. Hi. Seven days hello. to go, and you got fascinating split screens all over the place. All right, um, Kamala Harris, closing argument any moment now. I just spoke to Ian Sams. A lot of the conversation has been about Donald Trump and what happened in Madison Square Garden and the comments that he made on Puerto Rico. Within about the last hour or so, Trump addressed that. Let's start there. And I want you to know that Puerto Rico stands behind you, and Puerto Rico loves you. Well, we love it. I I know it very well, and we helped you through a lot of bad storms. But I think no president's done more for Puerto Rico than I have. 
All right, case closed, that's it, moved on. Move on, or damage done? Well, look, I mean, it was a comedian who's known for his shock value, but certainly with Trump having the momentum in this race and being so close to the finish line, this is an unforced error that I, that I wish hadn't happened. That being said, I think Trump is right to kind of move on. It was, it was an off-color joke and moving right along. Are you guys going to let him move on? Uh, it's not about whether we do or not. Trump could move past this if he would apologize. It's more than just being a comedian. Trump paid for the microphone. He gave him a global audience to trash the island. And all my friends from Puerto Rico who are of Puerto Rican descent are very upset with this because they're used to America, their fellow Americans insult them by suggesting they couldn't even be a state if they wanted to. It's very offensive when you add that element to this debate and to have a potential president of the United States give a platform to someone to call their home trash. Of course they're going to be offended, and he needs to apologize for his role in elevating that speaker or comedian. Julia, I'm looking at both uh, campaigns here, Julia and Joe. Let, let's show those graphics real quick and start with Donald Trump. He's going to Michigan, Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, New Mexico, Nevada. Pump the brakes for a second. <laughs> I just said New Mexico and Virginia. Yeah, it kind of what? reminds me of what the map was looking like when President Biden was at the top of the ticket. We were writing a lot of stories at that time about New Mexico and Virginia potentially flipping um, for Trump's in Trump's favor at the time. The Trump campaign was talking about potentially investing in those two states. So, I mean, I think it gives the optics, it gives the illusion maybe, um, mm. the idea that they're looking to expand the map. But we are, of course, seven days out. So not a lot of time left. Here's, here's Harris, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, Nevada. Those are the seven key swing states. The battlegrounds. It doesn't, I think, make much sense to do anything other than those battlegrounds right now. If it's a flex about expressing confidence, I think that's just hard to understand at this point. Every single poll shows this is the closest election that we've seen in generations. You don't have another minute. People are already voting now. You got limited minutes. It just seems like it would make more sense to camp out in the places that matter. Why, why is he going to Virginia and New Mexico? So I think it's a different question for Democrats and Republicans. Democrats have ground games, aggressive ground games in all these states. It's why we raised so much money. A lot of his went to legal defense funds. And Republicans typically don't have a such advanced degree of a turnout operation. And when you're not, when you don't have turnout operation in these states, you can go where you want because you're hoping the earned media is mm. going to push you over. She's combining the visits to the states where she's got ground operations and they're using those effectively to do both. So he, there's no downside to going to some of these states for him, I don't think. What about those numbers that I just did with Scott Tranner that is showing clear shift out west you could say, at least early on, good news for Republicans. Well, here's what I would suggest. That's assuming that every Republican is voting for Donald Trump. And we know that that's not the case. In this election, there is going to be a record number of Republicans voting for Kamala because Trump has reset the race. I mean, these dynamics are changing. We could have people that have never voted in their lifetimes turn out to vote. We could have lifelong Republicans who are the Liz Cheney and Mitt Romney's of the world voting for Democrats. You can't read too much in these numbers. What you need to understand is you should just go vote. <laughs> Hillary Clinton in 2016, one of the, she, Hillary Clinton lost for a lot of reasons, but as we talked about here on the show yesterday, one of them was because she wasn't in Michigan. She wasn't in Wisconsin down the home stretch. And I'm looking at Trump in uh, Virginia and New Mexico. She's camping out in the seven states, although she is down the road tonight. I mean, look, I think the Trump campaign has also been in the seven battleground states. The, I think I would still rather be the Trump campaign than the Harris campaign mm -hmm. right now. The trend line over the last 30 days, the polls in all seven battlegrounds have shifted toward Trump and away from Harris in terms of unfavorabilities. The more interviews she does and the more voters get to know her, they don't like her. Um, so I think the Trump campaign is, is in a good spot, and I think they're hoping to. They're running confidently. They're, they're having fun. And I think they're hoping to put a few more states in play. All right. Meantime, the Washington Post owner, uh, Amazon founder, multi-billionaire however many times over, Jeff Bezos, defending his decision to withhold the paper's presidential endorsement despite losing more than 200,000 subscribers. Bezos writing in his own uh, outlet, quote, the Washington Post and the New York Times win prizes, but increasingly, we talk to only a certain elite. More and more, we talk to ourselves. Now, the Washington Post facing a major backlash, losing more than, as I mentioned, 200,000 subscribers after the non-endorsement. Now, Bezos also owns the aerospace company Blue Origin and addressed reports that executives from that company recently met with Trump. He says they were just doing business, all a coincidence. Look, Julia, you, you cover Washington. You know this. Um, Amazon's a $2 trillion company, the second or third biggest in, in the country. You got Blue Origin literally trying to go to outer space. And you got the Washington Post, which I believe last year lost or was on track to lose close to $100 million. Right. 
Bezos has business before this town, if not every single day, nearly every single week. And is he willing to go down that route, knowing where the post is and where his other businesses are? And is that the calculation that he made? You know, it seems like that's the calculation. But I would, you know, I think when I look at this story, I look at this from a journalist. And I would hope that people aren't conflating the decisions of the head of a, you know, the the company that owns Um, the Washington Post, um, the editorial, and also the editorial board with the newsroom. I don't, my biggest fear is that there are hardworking journalists at the Washington Post who are being punished for a decision that they had nothing to do with. You know this, he's got business, you know, he's before this town nonstop. Yeah. Washington Post is is one of his entities. And and look, he, in his own op-ed explaining the decision, he diagnosed a couple of problems that he's right about. People have lost trust in certain media. Mm -hmm. The problem is, his response to that, I think, is wrong. His response was, we're just going to end endorsing entirely as a way to bring faith back into the system. What he did is the exact opposite, exactly because of the optics that you just laid out, that he's got all of these interests, and whether he explicitly says, that's not why I'm doing this, that's what everybody thinks. It's, it's fascinating because you got Elon Musk jumping up on stage with Donald Trump in a 50-50 race, the second wealthiest, Jeff Bezos basically saying... We're not we're not well, going there at this point in time. I'll quickly yeah. say that Real I, quick, I as, as a lobbyist, I've seen too many times corporate America pretend politics doesn't exist in DC. Oh, it exists. And it's our core. So oh, I would just say well, you didn't know this when you're going to buy the paper. It, it, that's that's, that's <laughs> yeah. part of it. All right. Uh, by the way, we will have special election coverage on News Nation starting Monday. Uh, I'll join Marky Martin to co-host Morning in America at 6 a.m. Alarm well before that. We'll also have an early start Wednesday after election night uh, at 5 a.m. And our News Nation coverage, of course, continues all week long. But I'll see you in the mornings next week. Panel, thank you all. Appreciate it. Still to come here on the Hill. Exactly one week to go until Election Day. Live looks all over the country right now. Harris in D.C., Trump in Pennsylvania, Leland Vitter, other side of the break. All right, welcome back. Leland Vitter, host of On Balance, fascinating scene across America tonight. D.C., PA, you've got Bill O'Reilly coming up. We do indeed. Bill O'Reilly made a fascinating prediction in December of 2023 Mm. about the election. Well, you're going to have to stick around Ah, to find out. There we go. Uh, But we are going to play it for Mr. O'Reilly and see uh, how true it proved. But it was a fascinating observation Uh, at the time, remains so. Uh, what a juxtaposition, right? The Harris campaign yeah. who runs like a Swiss clock hmm. um, on these uh, rallies 